Dr. Venkatraman uh, Ramakrishnan shared the 2009 Nobel Prize for Chemistry. He is one of the finest minds in his field, somebody who's focused extensively in the last several years on ribosomes. Um, it's a great privilege for us at NDTV to be interviewing him. Thank you very much, sir, for speaking to us. Um, a lot of your work is, is often difficult to understand because it's pure science. Um, and a lot of people who would be watching this program would want to know where your study of ribosomes actually leads us. And how would you answer that question? Well, the first thing you have to realize is that ribosomes are fundamental to life. And by that I mean that uh, every protein, uh, almost every molecule in your cells were either made by the ribosome or made by enzymes which were th themselves made by the ribosome. So you can see that, that the ribosome is fundamental to how life works. Uh, to understand the ribosome, you have to realize uh, what it actually does. So you must know that we all have genetic material. Our genes uh, reside on DNA, and there are thousands of genes, typically about 20,000 uh, or, or, or more genes in our body. And most of these genes code for proteins. And if you ask what are proteins, they're uh, large polymers that carry out the many different functions of our uh, uh, body. Mm -hmm. So for instance, there's a protein in your blood called hemoglobin, which carries oxygen from your lungs to your uh, tissues. Uh, the way you're looking at me now is only possible because there's a detector in your eyes mm -hmm. which senses light, and that's a protein called rhodopsin. Uh, if you uh, touch something and you feel it, uh, that's because there are uh, mechanosensory proteins uh, in your skin. Mm -hmm. So you get the idea, and so if you, if you get an infection, you make antibodies, but antibodies are also proteins. Mm -hmm. So you can see that there are hundreds and hundreds of different types of proteins which carry out all the uh, m many of the different functions that uh, are part of life. Now each of those proteins is made by following instructions encoded in our genes. So genes uh, are originally in the form of DNA, but a copy of them is made uh, in the form of messenger RNA, which is single-stranded, unlike DNA, which is two strands mm -hmm. in a double helix. Mm -hmm. Now mRNA is a sequence of four types of building blocks, mm -hmm. uh, which are called bases. Mm -hmm. Now, you can think of this as a, a long sentence in a four-letter alphabet. Right. Okay. Now, what the ribosome does is read this sentence, which is essentially a series of instructions saying, take this amino acid and then join it with this other amino acid and join it with this, because amino acids are the building blocks yes. of proteins. Yes. So by reading the information in one type of polymer, which is DNA or RNA, it's making a different type of polymer, which is the protein mm -hmm. that's encoded mm -hmm. in the genetic information. Mm -hmm. So you can think of the ribosome as a large translating machine that reads information in one type of uh, biological polymer, which is our genes, and makes a different kind of polymer, which is mm -hmm the protein that the gene codes for. Mm -hmm. And as I said, there are many different types of proteins, and each protein is, a, is coded for by a special gene. Mm -hmm. One of the other problems uh, is that the cell has to decide when to make proteins. Uh, for instance, your skin cells don't make rhodopsin, which is made in the eyes, mm -hmm. and your eyes is, uh, don't make hemoglobin, which is in your blood. Right. So these things have to be coordinated, and how much is made, and when it's made, and when it's degraded. Those are all complicated problems. But ultimately, every protein is made by the ribosome. It's essentially the translator. It's the translator, and it's the protein synthesizer. Right. So you can think of it as a cell's protein factory. Mm -hmm. So that's one reason why the ribosome is important. A second reason the ribosome is important is that because it's fundamental to life, it's, it's ancient. Mm -hmm. In fact, it comes from a world before there were proteins, a primordial form of life, if you like. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting because 
when you want to understand how life evolved, the origins of life, it, you know, the ribosome inevitably uh, figures in a central role in the origin of life of as life, we know yes. it today. The other reason is because it's so old, the ribosomes from humans and bacteria are slightly different. Mm -hmm. In fact, they're very different in some aspects. But even the core, uh, which is highly similar in both, is actually slightly different. And the reason that's important is many, many antibiotics work by blocking the bacterial version of the ribosome, but not affecting the human version so much. And that's why we can take them as medicines, so they don't kill us by killing our ribosomes, but they kill bacteria by blocking bacterial ribosomes. Mm -hmm. So some of these, like tetracycline, uh, erythromycin, mm -hmm. are very important antibiotics. Mm -hmm. In fact, the first effective drug against TB mm -hmm. is streptomycin, mm -hmm. uh, which also binds to the ribosome. I must ask you a question at this stage. When you're talking about antibiotics, we are in an era where there are multi-drug resistant infections, ICU born, yes. things like acetonobacter, uh, infections as partly as a result of the overuse of antibiotics in this country, people pop antibiotics as if they're popping, you know, something for a headache. Yes. How does that represent a fundamental challenge? Uh, and, and from a scientific standpoint, can you explain how antibiotics can potentially, new antibiotics can yeah. potentially overcome this challenge? Sure. So there are two aspects to this. One is a social aspect, which I'll come to in a minute. But the question you asked about how antibiotics work. Antibiotics are typically small mo molecules that bind to a much larger target, typically a protein enzyme, but often to a much larger entity like the ribosome. And the way antibiotics work is they bind in a pocket where they fit tightly mm -hmm. and prevent the machine from working. Because uh, let's say something else needs to bind in that pocket in for the machine to work, or the, po mm -hmm. or the shape has mm -hmm. to move, change. Mm -hmm and the binding of the antibiotic would prevent the change. Mm -hmm. So whatever the case, it depends on a tight fit between a small molecule and a pocket in a much larger molecule. The way resistance occurs is several. One is bacteria can make enzymes that break down the antibiotic. This is often the way penicillin resistance works. It breaks down mm -hmm. penicillin or similar mm -hmm. antibiotics so that the products of the breakdown no longer uh, fit tightly in this mm -hmm. pocket. Mm -hmm. So again, you've destroyed the fit. Mm -hmm. Another way of, uh, of the cell can ac acquire resistance, mm -hmm. bacteria can acquire resistance, is that um, you can modify the antibiotic by adding extra groups to it, chemical right. groups. This changes the shape of the antibiotic so it no longer fits nicely in the pocket. A third way is that the bacterium has what are called efflux pumps, mm -hmm. which uh, pump out the antibiotic so that it doesn't harm the bacteria. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And so before it can bind to its target, it's already pumped out of the cell. So uh, there are many ways of acquiring resistance, and resistance can be transferred mm -hmm. and so on. So the way scientists can uh, work on this is look at the actual way that antibiotics bind to the pocket, and we and others have done that with the ribosome with these atomic structures. And then you can ask, can I design something that might bind in that pocket even better? Mm -hmm. So as a result of these atomic structures, uh, companies, including a startup company founded by Tom Stites mm -hmm. and Peter Moore, Tom mm -hmm. Stites, as you know, was one of the people who shared the Nobel yes. Prize, uh, they founded a company to do ribosome-based uh, drug discovery, uh, to discover new antibiotics. And they were actually successful in finding new lead compounds mm -hmm. which would actually bind better and so on. But bringing something from, even from a biotech company all the way to the market yes. is a difficult problem sure. because of the cost involved and so on. And there's another problem and that is Antibiotics are not exactly uh, the darling of pharmaceutical companies. No. And the reason is, you know, a patient buys an antibiotic, f f let's say a week's course, and they're mm -hmm. cured. Uh, what pharmaceutical companies would rather have is uh, something the guy has to take every day of his life mm 
uh, for the rest of his life. Right. You know, for instance, you know, cholesterol drug or right. hypertension drug right. or whatever. Because it funds you know. Uh, whereas, you know, antibiotics, first of all, the number of people with infections is, you know, it's very large mm -hmm. in many parts of the world, but in the parts of the world where antibiotics are being developed, uh, you know, it's a, it's a somewhat of a niche market. And uh, moreover, a new antibiotic will only be used for that small fraction where uh, the infection is resistant to all of the known mm -hmm. antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of uh, business economic problems. And then there are also social problems. You alluded mm -hmm. to the fact of Indians popping antibiotics as mm -hmm. pills. The main problem is people can get antibiotics without a prescription yeah. here. And, and that's really a bad thing because most times when you get a headache or a chest infection or a, a nasal infection, it's a viral infection, it's a flu or a cold. And antibiotics won't help you. You just need to rest and, and uh, drink yeah. lots of water. Sure. Um, thank you for explaining a lot of the concepts which you worked at so closely. Um, you don't come to India that often. You were mentioning that you've got only extended family over here. You left India uh, when you were quite young. Um, what does India mean to you? Well, it's, uh, my relations with India are sort of triphasic. The first part is when I actually lived in India as a child, uh, and I grew up here. Uh, and I think, you know, no matter uh, how long you live elsewhere, uh, early childhood years and, you know, when you become an adolescent, those are, uh, in every human being, uh, those are the most memorable years because that's when we uh, form an impression of the world and form our sort of identity. Mm -hmm. So from that sense, uh, of course, uh, India's uh, always been part of my mm -hmm. uh, existence. Uh, the second phase was when I moved to the U.S. Now, when I moved to the U.S., and shortly afterwards my uh, sister uh, moved there, and then my parents uh, also moved there. So um, I didn't visit India very often. In fact, when I lived in the U.S. for th almost 30 years, I only visited India three times in about 30 years. So that's not very much at all. Mm -hmm. But what changed was after I moved to England, I came to a scientific meeting in India in 2002, uh, which was organized by the Indian Biophysical mm -hmm. Society. And that first exposed me to Indian scientists, and I made a, a, you know, a number of friends among them. And as a result, I've started visiting India almost every year since 2005. So it's not true that I don't visit India very often. Since 2005, I've visited India uh, essentially every year. And nearly all my time is spent on campuses. Sure. So I either give talks or I meet young scientists and postdocs and students, uh, other colleagues. So I, I, I do try to uh, interact with Indian science. Yeah. It's been a pleasure speaking to you, sir. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Thank you so much indeed.